what if, what if you could increase the number of entrepreneurs in a community by 10 times? No, in a university, if you have, say last year, if you have five companies that came out of this, this university, what if you can make it 50? Would you, would you attract more uh, admissions? Would more employers come and look for people with more skills here? What about if you did that in a, in a community? That means in a village or in a, in a larger community or a nation, if you could increase the number of entrepreneurs by 10 times, you would create maybe 10 times more jobs. Maybe you'd solve 10 times the number of problems. Or may even uh, create 10 times the number of wealth, amount of wealth. Now, what about peace? Uh, the pr one of the primary causes of uh, the Arab Spring in 2010 was unemployment. Now, we could talk about creating entrepreneurs, but how do we do this? Are entre can entrepreneurs be made, or are they certain special snowflakes that are born that way? I believe that entrepreneurs can be made. And that have, has been my research at MIT and my life's work for the last 10, 15 years. If you look at incubators and several programs that the government puts out, or any other kind of community puts out, what you see is they're all looking for aspiring entrepreneurs to help them create companies. But that's only a minus, very, very small percentage of the larger population. My focus is, can we focus on the larger population? That means if you can create entrepreneurs from the larger population, you could actually change it by 10, 50 times. And I find there are three major factors that change uh, any ordinary person to start to think that they could be a, become an entrepreneur. One is internal. Internal means the self-efficacy or the confidence that you have that you can do something on your own. And that only comes from doing things, failing several times, and you know, learning from that and expanding your field of competence. And that is how you build your confidence. And self-efficacy is the self-confidence to take on an unknown challenge. And that ability you get only through failing multiple times and figuring out from there. Second factor is the external factor, which is the ecosystem that, that is around you. That means mentors that are around you, maybe the society, the cultural pressures, or even a place where you can actually go do things. And that external factors obviously will accelerate the, the kind of change. But I feel the most important one is the interventional factor. That means how early can you get involved in a kid's life and start to change their thinking a little bit. So over time, they start to, you know, over the next 20 years, they would be in a very, very different place. I grew up in a little village in India. When I was 10 years old, I, uh, there was a radio repairman in my village. And he showed me how to open up a radio and see the speaker, yeah. electronics. I always thought there were little people living in radios you know, who can sing and play music and such. You know. uh, he showed me all these things. And he even taught me how to solder. And I was 10 now, 11 years old, something like that. I believe that was one of the biggest influence I had in my life, where I went on to study electronics engineering and became a product designer, entrepreneur, and different things in my life. So I believe early intervention would, be the, would give you the largest return in life. So when you look at how do you create this entrepreneur, I looked at my own life and see, you know, as I said, growing up in a lower middle class family in a small village in India, uh, what kind of changes did I go through to reach this place where I am? You know, I've done multiple companies in the US and created, designed a lot of products in my life. Uh, but I think there is a certain pattern, and I took this pattern and I tested it out on other students to see if, if I tested, if I took them through the same process, would you change your attitudes? And the first stage is a four step process. The first stage is what I call a zero. Zero just means an uninitiated student. If you go to any university, you would see students 
who are trying to graduate and find a job. Universities have taken them through all kinds of book knowledge, but very little practical hands-on experience. Now, how do you take these students? And they primarily are job seekers. They want to go find a job. And the first stop is to make them into a maker. A maker is someone who can think of things and with your hands make it. You know, when we were kids, we used to take cardboard boxes and, you know, bottle caps and popsicle sticks and stick them together and made things. Of course, they weren't the greatest products, but we could actually think about things and make them. How many of you have ever made, at least in the, in the last one week, made anything? Or in the last one month, how many of you have made anything? We, we have kind of lost that art over, as we grow up because, you know, we focus on other things. And the next stage is a stage of an innovator where he, the person learns to solve problems. When the first maker hacks things and makes things that are feasible, an innovator needs to hack a problem and make things that people really desire. And the third, last stage is a stage of an entrepreneur where he converts the problem into an opportunity and creates something that is even viable. Now, I will go into the three stages. The f stage of a maker, if you want to make a beautiful piece of furniture, you need to learn the craft of woodworking. So craft of woodworking may take several years before you can actually create an artistic piece of furniture. You know, if I would have been a rock star if it wasn't for, I didn't spend enough time learning the craft of playing a guitar. So I'm where I am now. So the craft is what is stopping you from becoming, getting to the art. Now, when you really look at, uh, if you can accelerate this learning of craft, you could actually learn, take them through much faster cycle time of learning and failing. So when you look at digital fabrication, that actually enables you to think of an idea, design it on computer. I can piece of, put a piece of wood, and my CNC machine would actually cut it for me. I don't need to know planing. I don't need to know all the woodworking craft. Or I can put, print it out on a 3D printer. So I can accelerate this learning cycle. And that's what we use. And I don't think uh, age is, or experience is, or, is a bar in, in any, any way. I have taught kids 8 years old through 65 years old the same process of learning and do, doing things. And the whole purpose is to design something, make something, and play with it. Don't worry about solving any world problems. So we created this program called the 48-Hour Maker Fest, uh, where we teach them to ideate. Ideate is when you think, sit around and think about how to create something. And they bring ideas and you know, teach how do you think outside your little zone of comfort. And then they learn to CAD it, the physical product. They may, mechanically, they'll CAD it. They learn electronics. They code. Within 48 hours, by end of 48 hours, they would have a working prototype. Just starting from zero, they, we can actually take them through that. So what we are doing here is that these kids are learning to you know, design and make electronic parts and such. And, and then they need to create some products, as I said, in two, two days. And this team made a little baby cradle, automatic baby cradle. So when you put something in the cradle, and it's all done in two days. Okay. And that's a cockroach buster. Anything that moves inside, you can suddenly wrap the cockroach inside. But of course, these are all the fun things to do. You know, I'm sure nobody's going out and selling this cockroach buster anywhere out in the market. But what you see is that after at the end of the second day, these kids are on fire. They have suddenly realized certain potential that they never realized they had. And, you know, things such as this. This is what they call a useless box. When you turn it on, it will turn itself off. And it can get angry, and it can play with you, you know. But think of it as an experience that you are creating. So the designer has to think about how do I create this, design this experience that the user wants to see? 
from there figure out what kind of physical product do I make from there. Then they have to do the design, the mechanical parts, do design the electronics inside, write the code, write the software to realize the experience that they want to get. And these are the kids, uh, here. I think they were from Inti. So how young can you go? So we did this on sixth grade students, which is about 11 years old. And they created this robot that kicks a ball at a goal post that scores a goal, you know. And at six years old, which we, uh, the funniest thing was this was in Saigon. We ran the program at the end of the night. These kids would not leave the lab. And the parents were all waiting outside till 10, 11 o'clock at night because they were so engrossed. They suddenly realized something they could do. And these are the ones, you know. So if six grade students can do it, I believe, you know, you don't need an engineering degree to do any of these products. The next stage is a stage of, of, of an innovator. Innovative, you need to un go to a community, observe, understand the kind of problems, and define what kind of need that you can see, that you can solve. And from there, ideate again solutions. And we use design thinking as a process to go through this, get to the end. Uh, we develop empathy for the con con uh, customer, and from there, we define the need and create solutions. We normally take them to places where they're not, you know, they not comfortable going, such as, you know, this is in a rubber estate somewhere and cattle farm, or uh, this is where they, may, they were making co uh, coconut fiber ropes. And these are my students who actually go there and spend their time. And this was in a little tiny tribal village. We spent a day in the village actually sleeping in their huts to understand what kind of problems they face in life so that you could come back and actually understand, create the kind of problem that we could solve. Uh, this was in a hospital for kids with cerebral palsy. You know, unless we go live their life, you will never understand what the problems are. And from there, we design the kind of products that we do. Uh, this is one of the teams that, uh, they went to a hospital and they found kids, neonates, that is pre-born. Uh, they have a tendency to uh, get uh, sleep apnea. Sleep apnea is some, when in adults, when you suddenly you stop breathing while you're sleeping and you suddenly wake up out of breath. But in little babies, they don't wake up. They just die and it's called sudden infant death syndrome. And these kids, these students suddenly decided that they want to take this up as a problem. And they created a little boot that the baby wears and it looks for blood oxygen content. So when they stop breathing, the oxygen content goes down and we put in uh, vibrating motors to tickle the baby so that the baby would wake up and start breathing again. And they have gone on to make it into a little strap that the baby can wear. Because really what happens is that in a, in a rural hospital, they give the baby to the mother and say, go home, because we can't keep the baby in the hospital forever. Okay, this is pre-born by maybe a month or a few weeks, but there are several, several cases where the baby could lose its life uh, at home. And in this case, they went to a school for, a home for blind girls. And after the, staying with them and talking to them, they realized that one interesting problem is that they cannot see, they cannot feel uh, a, a, a obstruction at eye level. So they can only feel what the cane can touch. So they said, we normally walk into branches and it, we hit, it hits our head. And these kids came back and said, we need to create something. So they created something what they call the torchlight for the blind. Basically, it's an ultrasonic sensor. It can, it'll vibrate differently depending on what kind of distances are there in front of them. So they can feel that there is something coming up and they, could, and they attach it to a cane, and it became a company. They actually started a company uh, with, the, with the product. The last stage is a stage of an entrepreneur. Now that you know you have a problem which people really want solved, you have a solution that solves it, now can you understand how to create, how to monetize it? Can you create a company that can create the product how do you reach the customer? How do you pull together a team? And of course, an entrepreneur looks at a problem as an opportunity. I've been doing these kind of programs all across the world, and I must have done for some 45 such workshops. And I believe one thing I learned from there 
is that I've taught students from MIT, very high-end technology schools to rural, rural engineering schools. And one observation I had is that if you can define intelligence as the ability, to, ability for someone to understand a new concept deep and fast, I see zero difference between the students at MIT or students at, in a rural school. Zero difference. There's no difference in intelligence. But the difference is in the ex exposure that they have to, to other things. So that means the more you know, the easier it gets to learn. It's, you know, so if I can give you a new concept, you can really interpolate and extrapolate from, from what you know. So the, as, a, as a teacher and as an institution, our idea is how do we give more, expose these students to newer and more things? So starting with building an ecosystem, you know, if, if, if we, that is a way to start this whole process where we would build a small ecosystem within a college and that would consist of students who have been trained and who now they want to do things and more students get involved. They do more things like the other students see. They all want to get involved more. We also need to have mentors who can teach and mentor these students. And we need to have a place. That means you have a lab where the people come in. It's like a watering hole where they can come and hang around and do things. Do fail. Actually, I, I want my students to fail several, several times. Because only then you start losing the fear of failure. And only when you lose the fear of failure, you start reaching out for the edgy things that you thought you could never do. So for that, you need to actually build that confidence. So once you build that ecosystem, in these universities, you have all these students. And then you can reach out to the local schools. So the same set of students from in universities can actually go out to teach in, in schools. Uh, two, in last summer, I taught in, in India, where I had 48 students from MIT and uh, ASB and, and, and several other large schools. At the end of the whole program, they went out to 12 schools and taught another 600 school students, high school students. But this is the only way we can actually uh, exponentially scale up this whole process. Of course, when you have entrepreneurs in the schools and colleges, they start having entrepreneurs in the community. Once you have this, you have actually changed. You have changed the community where you can actually go out and start solving real problems. As I said, the primary factor we are trying to change is the self-efficacy, the confidence that you can build that says that you can go take on an unknown challenge. Only if you think you can do things, you will like even have the courage to go do these kind of things. But our large goal is to create employability amongst the graduates, so they can actually go out and hit the road running, they can actually do things, and also create entrepreneurship. If you create entrepreneurs, I believe they will transform the community, they'll create jobs, they create wealth, and you know, most probably they'll create peace. Thank you.